Without further ado, Jofi, I remember back in 2015 when Turbine was being created and not long after that, only like one year, 2016, you, already, you guys already won some um, accelerator program from Korea. And after that, you won the, the Central European Startup Awards for the best startup program. So Turbine is a really cool company that started with a really, really important mission, and I really value that. So, Jofi, can you come and tell us a little bit more about that and, of course, about the gap between the product and, if, what is the name? Product Managed Gap, Insertion of Data in Science Biology. Thank you very much. <laughs> Give hands for Jofi. Thank you. Um, okay. Cool intro, thank you for that. So uh, my topic is about the translation gap, so basically how it's like being a product manager at the intersection of data science and biology. And my background is more in product management, data science, AI, and the last time I learned about biology was probably high school, and even then it was mostly about mushrooms and different animals. So when I joined Turbine, basically most of the meetings were like white noise to me. So uh, because of this, because of my experiences, I, um, I wanted to tell you some stories about Turbine and, and also um, introduce some best practices that helped me like, overcome this translation gap. And uh, they're not revolutionary, but I think also with the turbine stories, they might be interesting for other product managers who are working with uh, cross-functional teams. Um, but to explain the problem or, or like what we're doing at Turbine, so basically it's a drug discovery company. And um, with drug discovery, there is this phenomenon called Eurom's law, which is basically the inverse of Moore's law, which we all know. And it's basically the... Um, the decline of uh, research of development uh, effectivity in the drug discovery. And this is a huge issue. Like currently, developing a new drug costs $2.3 billion. And the project at ROI and pharma R&D have fallen to 1.2%. So why is this a problem? Like who's actually... <laughs> um, impacted by this, and that's actually people and patients, because if you, if you have some sickness that is, has only a small group of people, it's just financially not viable to develop a, um, a drug for you. Or, for example, um, for some people or some patients, the drug is just way too expensive and they cannot afford it. Um, so we need to do something um, about this. And just to explain why this happens, um, I'm sorry about this graph, it's, it's, uh, it's from a scientific journal, but basically when we w are developing a, a drug, we want to make sure that it's safe and effective for the patient. And for this, it needs to go through a very long and rigorous uh, testing cycle. So how it works at first is basically a biologist comes up with a hypothesis, they're like experimenting on cell lines, they're trying to, to find a new uh, drug target, then they develop a compound for it, and then the first phase, phase over here, is the preclinical stage, where they're, they're basically putting the drug into some type of animal, like a rat or a mice, to, to prove that it's safe enough for humans. And then as the next step, phase one is also like the first human study, where we check if it's really uh, safe in humans, that drug. And then comes phase two, and phase two is the critical phase, because only one out of five drugs gets through this phase, and that's basically proving that your drug is effective. So after all the years of development and investment, at the end of phase two, for most of the drugs, it turns out that it's just not effective. And whatever worked in the cell line, and then whatever worked afterwards in the animal, just uh, does not translate to the patient. And this is called the translational gap in, in drug discovery. Um, and of course, um, 
there's an opportunity with, uh, with AI to solve this. So basically when this happens and the scientists are here and they have a failed drug, the thing is they don't really understand what went wrong. They don't know if they uh, picked the wrong target, developed the wrong drug, gave the wrong uh, dosage, or just selected the wrong patients. What we know is that all that investment is might be lost, uh, and their hypothesis was wrong. And AI can basically help to make better predictions that actually translate in patients down the line. So we at Turbine, we're, oops, sorry, we're uh, developing a simulated cell technology where we're basically simulating what happens inside the cancer cells. And with this technology, we're running billions of simulations to see what type of patients what react to what type of drugs or mutations. Uh, and what actually takes us apart, like other AI drug discovery companies give you a prediction, and that's basically a back box. So you don't really have a, a way to understand why you got that prediction. But for AI, because we're simulating how the cells work, the biologists can basically open up the cell and look inside and understand exactly why the drug worked, what happened, and create a really strong biological mechanism, or like a hypothesis, and then measure that exactly in the lab and prove that, that um, that it works. Um, yes. And for this, basically, the platform that we're building, we want biologists to be able to use it. We want um, that they don't require any extra coding knowledge or, or data science knowledge to be able to interact with the platform. So basically, on the simulation configuration page, the biologist can select like what cells they want to select, whether it patient or uh, mice or cell lines, what drugs they want to simulate, what are the doses that they want to uh, simulate it, and then um, it can add any type of mutation. So it's very similar, like as they are uh, describing in a lab the experiments that they want to run, but instead of having to wait a few weeks and get a few data points, um, they're running basically virtual, we call it in silico, uh, experiments that are billions of uh, simulations and uh, and run within a few hours. Um, so of course these simulations generate a huge amount of data, and that's also like not really comprehensible for for human uh, for the human mind. So of course we need also for the simulation data that's like terabytes of um, of simulation data some uh, processing. To, to create reports and to create visualizations that the biologists can actually make sense out of. Um, and then they end up looking kind of something like this, which is maybe for you just plots and like colorful charts. But for biologists, it's actually a very intuitive way to understand uh, what happened and find new hypotheses, new biomarkers that are novel, so no one has found them yet. Um, yes, but of course, in order to develop a product like this uh, and be customer focused, you really have to understand um, also biology. So, an ideal co worker inside Turbine would be someone who's maybe a data scientist um, or knows uh, AI or engineering, but also has a very deep biological knowledge. And to be honest, there's very few people who are like this. We have a few actually inside the company, but it's a very rare breed. So basically, we need to work in cross-functional teams uh, to be able to, to build this product. And um, yes, so cross-functional teams are basically a group of people with different functional expert expertise working toward the same common goal. And this is nothing new. I think most product managers in most companies work in some type of uh, cross-functional team. Um, but a Stanford study has found that 75% um, of cross-functional teams are dysfunctional. So, um, and that is, I think, mainly because of different miscommunication. Um, and then especially for, for Turbine, where cross-functional teams end up looking um, something like this, it's, it can be a huge problem. So basically, we have on one side developers, AI and engineers, data scientists, so people who have very much the engineering mindset. They mostly worked in the industry, they use Scrum, 
And on the other side, we have pharmacists, doctors, chemists, bioinformaticians. They most likely worked in academia and, and they have a scientific background. So these two sides speak completely different languages. It's very difficult to understand each other and it can create sometimes a divide uh, between the two sides. And as a product manager, it's of course your job to be the translator of the, of the users and the customers, but also in these cases, you sometimes end up being the translator also inside the team and within teams. Um, so that's why I thought it would be useful to go, go through some examples of problems that we had at Turbine. Um, about this. So I think the, the first thing that, like some of these points are going to be very obvious, nothing revolutionary, but it's really important to choose the right team members. It's actually key to your success. So for, ex for example, in our case, when Balint became an engineering lead uh, in the services team, um, and he had um, um, scientist Esther in, her team, in his team, he was a little bit unsure what he's going to be able to do with her, like what type of task he can give her, how is this going to look like and work. Um, but actually Esther was really proactive and very much interested also in what her team, teammates were doing. Um, so over, ta over the years, she also picked up some coding knowledge and then currently, besides being a translational scientist, she also stepped into the role of being a junior data analyst, uh, which is, I think, really, really cool. So it's important to have strong, communication, strong communicators in these diverse uh, teams. And uh, of course, when you have di diverse people and diverse mindsets, besides generating problems, they also can generate new ideas. Um, also, it's very important to set the goal for the team and define the responsibilities and the roles of the team. This helps um, to avoid um, information gaps or, or uh, repetition of work or delayed projects. Um, also, on the, other on the other hand, it's important to choose the right leaders. And what worked well for us in Turbine is, for example, we have product managers that are actually having a scientific background. So we have a chemist that is uh, a product manager. We also turned one of our translational scientists who, is, who was the lead of actually the translational guild in our company into a product manager. So this really helps to... to um, um, to work together to choose real experts and very strong communicators as your leaders. Uh, so when you have a team set up for running the team, the next point is also going to be super obvious, but building trust and relationships in the team is really important. So this can be team buildings, uh, board game nights, regular 101s, and this is important because if you have openness within the team, um, you can, you can um, trust that you can share your ideas, you can ask stupid questions, because you are going to ask a lot of stupid questions, because you're, you don't know each other's fields and you just don't understand, like maybe your colleague has a PhD in something and you don't even understand the absolute basics. So you have to be able to be confident or like trust the other person that, that you can ask these type of questions. For example, very recently, one of our product managers who worked for years in the organization um, asked uh, in a meeting what is sharding because she has heard this w the, the development teams using this word for years, but she was always a little bit too shy to ask. So it's fine, even after a few years, it's a really good sign that she, that she put out this question and then of course everyone was really happy and supportive to, to explain. Um, Yes, so also kind of a basic point is communication, establishing norms and expectations and adopt the style. And to be able to adopt the communication style to the specific team members, you have to be aware of your own style and understand like what jargon you are speaking. So for me, I think what works sometimes really well is to try to imagine that I'm talking to a non-scientist, non-technical person. So just imagining talking to my mom and how I would explain it to her, that's probably a good way to, to communicate with each other. But also, of course, it's not really always possible. So creating a simple common language is important and trying to avoid very technical terms, acronyms um, can help. But of course, for example, for us, I think it's not entirely possible. So for someone who 
listens to the turbine language outside of the or organization, I think is not really understandable. But also within the teams, we have different vocabulary, which can lead to a lot of miscommunications and misunderstandings. So what we are doing for that is uh, creating a common glossary or dictionary where we actually define <laughs> what the different words mean. And sometimes these lead to heated conversations, but at the end of the day, I think it helps us to be on the same page when we're, um, when they're talking. And of course, it's really important to constantly check for understanding frequently. Here you can summarize, repeat what the other person has said, ask a lot of questions, um, to make sure that, that you're actually talking about the same thing because a lot of times it turns out that we have a different understanding of what, what uh, something means. And of course, even if you do all of these things, there is still going to be um, conflict and difficult situations. Um, so I think it's just important to be um, empathetic and patient and uh, what helps for me is I um, imagine these eight stages of emotional response uh, and try to pu put the person on that and, and try to handle them um, accordingly. But I think as a product manager, it's really important to not only uh, be prepared for conflict, but actually embrace it because the differing opinions are lots of times just opportunities for, for learning and growth and finding a new solution to things. And here, actually, I think I have a very specific example example in Turbine um, that uh, we had roughly half a year ago this problem that the biologists were starting to become more and more frustrated because their idea they couldn't really formulate and and give value to their ideas and because of this lots of times they ended up at the the uh, end of the backlog and they were not being developed so basically how it worked that they maybe had an idea but the, what they said why we should develop this is because then it's more biologically accurate. But there is no KPI and metric for biological accuracy, unfortunately, or at least they couldn't really find one for their idea and solution. And because of this, they were not developed and they got onto the anger, bargaining, depression angle somewhere, which was, of course, a, a, an issue. So um, let me just give you some examples of how we resolved it. So here, knowledge sharing uh, was really important. Uh, choosing um, uh, a champion that can be really a cross-language translator it helped us tremendously. So the guild lead of the translational guild, which is like one of the scientist leads in Turbine, um, was, for example, a product manager, and that really helped us because she worked together with the biologists to, to define exactly like how they can overcome this problem. And what they came up with is, for example, it, this template is basically a screenshot. I just screenshotted it uh, from the... the um, from our confluence, so basically giving a template to the to the other side um, for information sharing, and we created this biology biology backlog where basically the biologist can, could track and fill out this form, and with that um, we found kind of a common language of how they can communicate their ideas. And here, of course, it was important to describe the complex biological pro problem in an easy way, also give some t-shirt size estimation, and the improves what, that's the key, like being able to formulate KPIs or some way of why they need that or how it's gonna help us that we de develop that besides besides biological validity. And because we saw that this is really tough for some biologists, what we also did is that we were kind of tracking this, uh, the items in the biology backlog, and if we saw that the biologist had, for example, a tough time, um, especially formulating the, the improves what part, or the description was still too deep biology and not really understandable by engineers, they were assigned to a data scientist uh, in the organization, and then they helped to fill this form out together uh, to actually um, define the value and get their idea to development. Um, and then, of course, like visualizing processes, 
extremely helpful. Uh, we use Miro boards a lot for this. And this is basically just the process of this biology backlog of, um, from the ideation so that we can track where the different uh, ideas and items are in the, um, in the, in the backlog, whether it needs more help from, from someone, data scientist or someone else, to actually really formulate the problem and also afterwards to track if these are being developed, uh, if the biologists can kind of help it somehow. But I think like visual, uh, visualizing processes really, really helps to be on the same page um, on, on how we are working together. Uh, and also, last but not least, um, I think what I also really love at Turbine that we have um, these organizational 101s. Last year, for example, we had like a, a three month AI training for the biologists and also the biologists do all the time like uh, biology um, 101s and they do like we call it Turbine Academy where we, they talk about different types of, of cancer. Um, and, and uh, what type of treatments are out there for them. And I think it's a super fun way to also, within the team, organize team tech, tech talks. So ask all the team members to do a presentation about their specific area and present it to their teammates. And it's a fun way to, to, learn, about, um, to learn about each other's way of thinking and, and uh, also like technical um, jargon. Um, Yes, and then by doing these, uh, I think at Turbine we have a pretty good common uh, lang Turbine language now, and this problem between uh, the biologists and engineers is very, um, way, way better. I think we are working together very harmonically currently. Um, and then this is great because we can actually focus on our real goal, which is um, curing patients. And, and also we have one of the most difficult jobs in the world because what we are trying to do is revolutionizing the, the drug discovery pipeline. Um, so it's something that has never been done before. So it's really important that we are aligned and work together um, as a team. And um, if any of this sounds um, motivating or interesting to you, uh, here's the part of marketing. We are always uh, hiring, so please check our website for open positions. And if you're interested in what's happening actually inside uh, the simulated cell, my colleague uh, Robert Chiposh will talk at 2.55 on the reinforce stage more about the algorithms inside the simulated cell. So uh, please check it out uh, if, you're, if you have time. And uh, any questions? I was about to ask to join hands for Jofi. Thank you, Jofi, for your, your, your talk. We have two questions already from Slido. You can see them on the, on the screen. Um, do, you, do we have any questions from the audience for those of you who are shy enough not to type the question? So let's go to the questions on the screen. So Jofi, the first question that we can see is, can you please share some best practices of how do you test for strong communication skills when hiring? Um, yes, actually, what comes to my um, mind was when I was being hired at Turbine, like my interview, especially my final interview, was not very easy. They pretty much grilled me very, very hard. <laughs> so it was a very embarrassing interview. Um, but at the same time, I think that was a really good way to see how, how I... Um, how I, I was behaving under pressure and how I'm trying to communicate and, and, um, and resolve conflicts. So I think like throwing the candidate a little bit in the deep water and roasting them a little bit or not, I wouldn't say roasting, but um, like giving them a bit of a hard time is a good way to see like if they can actually also in stressful situations remain calm and communicate their, their points um, calmly. Thank you so much. Our next question would be, what's your opinion of the balance between ethical and slow development and non-ethical but fast development? Not really a question, more an opinion, so. Sorry? 
not not really a question but an opinion so um, I think the thing is because I'm working for a startup and everything is very fast paced uh, we are very much more on the fast development side but I wouldn't call it unethical so um, not sure that's if that's if I understood the question right <laughs> please just, elaborate if I didn't yeah, please elaborate the question okay great <laughs> Um, what's your opinion of the balance between ethical and, and slow development? Oh, okay, so that was the, the previous question. The next question, what would be the most important skill for you when hiring someone? I actually have a, an opinion about this, but I'm very curious about yours. I think it, it very much differs based on the position. Um, oh, sorry. Um, let me think of an, an example. So for me, for example, when I'm hiring people in my team, for me, it's what's really important to see that they have a structured way of thinking, because I think when you have that, you have, you're much better at resolving um, lots of type of issues. But on the other hand, I think like cultural fit is, of course, really important. And like trying to imagine how that person would uh, be in that team, whether they have chemistry or if they would bring some new type of insight into the team, I think that's also uh, really important. Besides, of course, the obvious uh, hard skills that you need for the specific position. Honestly, I think that it's, it's exactly like you, how you said it at the beginning. It really depends on the position that you're hiring for, right? So if it's a technical position, you will want to see technical <laughs> abilities. But I think that if you want to go for soft skills, mm, in, in my experience, it's a can-do attitude. Nothing beats that. Someone that really wants to learn, someone that really wants to do something, they might not even have the, the full set of skills, but they want to do it, so it, you know, that's really cool. Yeah, or being pro proactive, Being for super example. proactive, yeah. Do you see yourself more like a product manager or a, or a scrum master? I'm wondering how the decision making about the future, the vision of the product is made. I'm definitely seeing myself as a product manager and not at all as a scrum master. I don't think I would be a great scrum master. Um, I'm wondering how the decision making about the future. Oh, yes, the vision of the product. So I think actually the previous presentation was very relevant for me because we are exactly in the process of the defining the long term company strategy and then based on that, the turbine strategy. Um, and it is sometimes a difficult process exactly for the reasons that were mentioned here before that uh, that of course like on the leadership level the CEO of course wants us to do as much as possible so they will push very strong and want everything right away um, and thinking about the future and building a good product strategy is exactly timing these like what needs to be in focus and when and it's it's just a negotiation process and it can be frustrating. Great, thank you. Um, can you briefly describe your company's performance during COVID period? And if you guys want to have a question in the meanwhile, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you, okay? We can keep going on Slido, no problem. You can also type your questions there, which is great. Just letting you know that you can also be on the stage, like not uh, exactly on stage, but yeah, you got me. <laughs> What is the next question? I next think question is, um, have you sometimes oh. reached a dead end in getting a cross-functional team up and running? An example, when you had to look for other organization design, or I, I believe or organization design, right? And in a particular case? Um. The questions are popping like crazy. Thank you guys for asking so many questions. <laughs> Let me think. Yes, I mean, probably, of course, there's some sometimes cases when, when actually we see that one of the team setup is not working quite well because maybe there is a, a missing component, maybe there's a missing skill still. But then in that case, we have to be creative and, and uh, 
um, figure out some solutions. So now that what one particular case that I can think about is that, for example, we have like the the hardcore interpretation team that are working on the simulation outputs and visualizations, and there the product manager is a biologist but doesn't know much about data, and she had a hard time, for example, challenging the engineering solutions, and the engineers tend to like go in different directions with what they want to do and how. Um, so there we were, for example, lacking leadership. Um, so uh, we had to look around for different ways um, to find some advisors, especially in data science, that can come into that team and consult them and actually challenge the, the data scientists about their solutions. So yes, you have to then kind of find a different way, but I would not say that I got, we reached a dead end, meaning that cross-functional teams just didn't work, it just something was missing in that team. Okay, thank you. The next question is less of a product management one, more like a management in general one, so do you think Hungary is a good place for a startup? <laughs> yes, I mean, Turbine is based in Hungary, um, I think, especially at the beginning of the company, it was really useful for us to be in Hungary because uh, there's lots of smart people in the country um, and the, also the founders had university connections to really be able to hire smart people. Just the network is smaller, so you could um, get help from, from very high-profile advisors, for example. But on the other hand, I think at, with our size, we reached a limit where it's really hard to um, hire just inside Hungary the talent because the talent pool is not that large. So at the moment, we, we became more global and are hiring from um, anywhere from the world and, and we just work um, remotely. So there's benefits and drawbacks and also I think sometimes what I feel like the mindset is just very different in, in a Hungarian startup than, than maybe other startups, and that's something that we need to work on. Great. Um, can you briefly describe your company's performance during COVID period? Yes, actually, I think this was something that we were very scared about when COVID started hitting, and we started discussing whether we will need to work remotely or not. Um, I think like before, I think we had like a one day home office policy and it was almost like on that day when that person took home office, we haven't heard anything from them. So it was a little bit scary, like, okay, now that everyone is gonna be in home office, how are we gonna be able to work? But it was actually super smooth and, and it worked so well that we never actually really went back to the office properly. Um, so, and, and it was, I think for us a very um, tough time because also as a startup you need to get your funding. It was not so easy. We had to um, push away our Series A a little bit, um, and uh, and that was first of all a little bit scary, but on the other hand motivating that we all knew that we have to like give everything to to get a good Series A. So actually, I think that uh, boosted our productivity. Thank you. Um, What's the current target date for the first drug by turbine on the market? That's a very good question, though. That's a really good question. So as I showed you the, on the first um, timeline, so you basically a drug has to go through all of these processes, um, and it just takes many, many years. So for us to actually get our own um, drug in the market will take a really long time. So at the moment we have uh, targets that are more in this preclinical stage, so there's still many, many years that we need to uh, progress, and also those stages are very resource intensive, they cost a lot. So we would not be able to pay for it on our own. Uh, lots of our competitors kind of try this strategy, but it's basically burning money and, and uh, it's very complicated. So what we're trying to do, we will definitely get partners for our internal assets to develop with them together and kind of collaborate in a collaboration and to prove that actually turbine can help in in drug discovery what we're aiming to do is instead of like here starting at the beginning and then like going through all the steps we are collaborating with uh, with lots of big pharma companies and we're trying to collaborate with ones that are 
more closer to the clinical stage and give them ideas uh, what type of partners they should be, or partners, patients they should be giving this drug to to be effective, what type of combination strategies they can um, uh, apply for their drugs in order to actually get this clinical validation and prove that, that our simulation platform is useful. And also we want to work with as many partners and collaborate, collaborations in the future as possible to, to actually help as many patients as possible. Thank you. Um, how do you handle transition from product teams to sales teams looking for partners? Uh, translation. What, um, what does this... Maybe, Vera, if you're in the room, maybe you can elaborate on the question. And if you're not in the room, can you elaborate the question on Slido at some point? Do you understand the question? I mean, I think that she's talking about uh, the way you talked about translation between teams mm -hmm. and uh, what is the correlation between the products team to the sales I, that being oh. in, in, the, in the optics of finding partners. Uh, that's my, my translation of the question. I think like also in the sales teams, because we see that um, we have this translation issue, we also have their scientists actually in the sales team that, are, that really understand biology and can understand like how we can use our product. Uh, and then of course the partners that we're talking to, they're usually also different groups, right? When we're talking to a big pharma partner, there are uh, business people who we have to kind of go through and there it's more about numbers and value, what we will bring to the table. But then in order to get a deal or work so together with a different company, you have to also go through the scientific level and there like really, there is really deep science conversations for which you need uh, uh, also scientific salespeople, but also uh, our uh, biologists are lots of times included in those meetings and creation of work plans. And actually, luckily, um, because we are a very science-oriented company, I feel like convincing the scientific teams of, of turbine is, is usually the easier part for us. And, and, uh, and then getting through the business deals and the negotiations, that can usually take more time. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all. OK. Do, did this answer the question, Vera? I mean, or? I think yes. I don't, I, I don't see Vera <laughs> in the stage, but OK. Um, what was the last challenge in Teams, and how long it took to resolve it? Um, I think this, um, th the last major challenge is actually the, the example that I just presented, I think about the biology versus engineering conflict. And, uh, and I would say that with this biology backlog and th with this um, process that we created, I think it took roughly about um, three, four months to actually like get everyone back to motivated when I think once the biologists were seeing that this process is working and their things are that they are being heard and their things are being uh, implemented that uh, that resolved uh, the conflict for us okay and our last question so far is how do you measure the impact of product in this specific line of business mm -hmm. so basically for us, the best measurement um, is um, to check how predictive we are, and then also because what I showed in the first slides, that the patient predictivity is the toughest part of this entire equation. For us, the good measure of that we're delivering value is that whatever we may be predicting in, in cell lines or, or in mice and everything actually translates in the clinic. So uh, what, what we're also working on is putting together benchmarks and check that how well we can actually predict the outcomes of these clinical studies versus other companies that are, that are doing uh, similar things. And that's basically the value that we're creating, that, uh, that there is a higher success rate in that phase two um, um, clinical study. All right, Jofi, thank you very much for being here today. Guys, please, let's join hands for Jofia. Thank you.